Hi everyone, this is Ms. Saunders here to talk about um, some examples of ethos, pathos, logos in our reading from week one. Um, I just wanted to, before I started looking at some examples from the text that we read, I just want to say, you know, I always prefer in your uh, discussion posts or in your papers, if you would use um, different quotes than the ones that I use in my lectures occasionally. Um, however, if you ultimately feel like you need to use the same quote for whatever reason, that's fine. Just make sure that you're saying um, something different than um, what I said about the quote, that your analysis is different. Um, and I say that because I really want the emphasis to be on your ideas, your critical thought, um, and not, you know, my own, although I am always grateful um, when people, you know, show me that they are paying attention during the lectures, because that's important too, an important part of being a student. Okay, so first I want to talk about ethos in A Letter from Birmingham Jail by, by Martin Luther King. Um, so first I will read the quote that I have here, which is admittedly very lengthy. It begins, I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every Southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. So I'm here along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Okay, so as we look for ethos as represented in the quote that I have here, I wanted to just, you know, even though I know we've been kind of reviewing these concepts a lot this week, but remind you guys that ethos deals with the character of the author, deals with their, our, our reader's perception of their credibility, as well as their competence, good intention, and empathy. So we see that Martin Luther King establishes his character by telling us that he is a man of God. He is the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably safe to assume that we, some of us feel, at least some of us feel that religious people who study or practice religion have a higher or more um, deeper or better moral faculty than the average person. Uh, religion makes people, um, it, it inspires people to be better, right? So by saying that he is a man of God, that he is a Christian, that he's a Southern, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he is suggesting that he is a man of good character, okay? We know that he is credible and competent because he tells us that he is president of the leadership conference. So by that, he is suggesting that he is someone who is capable of occupying a position of power. So that implies a lot of things, a lot of things, I think, about his credibility and his competency. He suggests that he is, you know, intelligent, capable, hard work, hardworking, you know, he has achieved a position of high distinction. We know that he suggests that his empathy, when he talks about, um, let's see, we, whenever necessary and possible, this is the third sentence, whenever necessary and possible, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates, okay? There he shows that he is com compassionate, right? And he is sharing what he has with people who are around him with like-minded goals. Um, so I think he is suggesting there that he is, you know, an empathetic and caring person for the people that are around him, and he is interested in making the world as a whole a better place. Um, we know that he has, I think he suggests that he has good intentions, right, in his texts. Um, so when he says in the fourth sentence, several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a, there's the important part, 
nonviolent direct action program if, if such were deemed necessary. So I think there it indicates a certain amount of good faith. And he kind of tells us that his, um, you know, his means are worthy. The way in which he is um, going about to achieve his goals are essentially nonviolent and peaceful in their nature, right? Which, you know, is inherently something that, that we like, right? That indicates a certain amount of human goodness. So, and then as we reflect back on the, you know, the overall purpose of this paper, it's to kind of draw attention to his unreasonable imprisonment in Birmingham jail. And I think Martin Luther King is an amazing writer, and I think he shows um, a lot of talent in, um, in his sentences and how he crafts, you know, this letter overall. Um, okay, so I thought in a good example of pathos, I found in Elegies for a Country Season by Zadie Smith, which is a piece on climate change, but it's a very kind of, you know, emotional and um, elegiac take on it. And for those of you guys who don't know what elegy mean, the word elegy is a name for a poem that is written to kind of mourn or celebrate someone who has been who is lost. Um, so just to clarify that real quick, but our, our quote here is, according to recent reports, if emissions of global greenhouse gases remain unchanged, things could begin to get truly serious around 2050, just in time for the seventh birthday party of my granddaughter. So we see here, this imaginary granddaughter is someone that Zadie Smith kind of references again and again throughout the piece. Um, I think, it, this imaginary granddaughter, I think, is used to inspire emotion and impact in the heart. That the reader acknowledges that they will that they will be unable to share the world as we know it now with this imaginary granddaughter, right? So while this granddaughter doesn't really exist yet, it's almost like a rhetorical device to make the reader feel something that hasn't happened yet, right? 2050, we're in 2019 now, but in 2050, right? Um, this hypothetical uh, birthday party maybe would not be able to happen because the world could be in such a state of jeopardy. And that's how I think she's appealing to our hearts there. And I didn't like to think of ethos, pathos, logos. Pathos is kind of like in your, in your heart, right? And then logos, which we'll talk about next, is kind of in your brain. That's the appeal to logic. So I thought logos in Masters of Love by Emily Smith um, I thought that there was a lot of, you know, examples of logos in this, um, in this article, but the quote I have here, the majority of marriages fail either ending in, in divorce and separation or devolving into bitterness and dysfunction. Of all the people who get married, only three in 10 remain in healthy, happy marriages. As psychologist Tai Tashira points out in his book, The Science of Happily Ever After, which was published earlier this year. So we see here, we see the, uh, the logos really apparent in the fact that we have, which is of all the people who get married, only three in 10 remain in happy, healthy marriages. Three is not a large portion of 10, it's very small. So it's kind of appealing, that appeals to us in a reasonable way so we can see, okay, here's a fact, um, you know, not that many people who get married stay happy. So, um, and I think, making that claim and supporting it with factual evidence kind of strengthens what she is saying. Um, and I think by the element of reason, we are able to be convinced um, that, um, that something is true, right? Because three is not a large part of 10. Um, all right, so those are just kind of a brief recap of um, Ethos, Pathos, Logos and how I was specifically seeing them operate um, in the readings for this week. And I hope that was helpful for you guys. Thank you.